All right, council, let's call to order the special council meeting. Here we are, September 27th already, 6.30 p.m. at the WC O'Neill Arena Complex Chambers. Uh, we're also uh, going to be airing this meeting through both Zoom and Facebook. I appreciate CHCO being here. Um, and let's just jump right into the recording of attendance. Uh, so I note that all members of council are in attendance with exception of Councillor Gumashell, no one online or? Okay, thank you. And uh, I do want to recognize that we're on the unceded traditional territory of the Beskotumogadi people. I'll be looking uh, for a mover to approve the agenda. We will be adding a closed session item tonight, but first let's get it on the table. Can I have a mover, please? I've got Councillor Bennett, seconded by Councillor Heenan. Um, now that it's moved and seconded, uh, we are going to add a closed session item. I'll pass it over to the town clerk to read uh, why we'll be going to closed session. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, so tonight we'll be going to closed session under the Local Governance Act, Section 681C, information that could cause financial loss or gain to a person or the local government or could jeopardize uh, negotiations leading to a contract or an agreement. And Section J, Labor and Employment Matters. Thank you very much, Mr. Knopper. Uh, could I have a mover to, uh, to amend the agenda to include the closed session? I've got uh, Councillor Harlan and seconded by Deputy Mayor Akaji. Um, all in favor of that amendment, please signify by saying aye. Amendment has been accepted. Is there any other changes to this evening's agenda? Seeing none, I will call the question. All in favor of approving the agenda, please signify by saying aye. That's everybody. The agenda is now approved. Disclosure of conflict of interest. Is there any this evening? Myself, I will be declaring uh, both the presentation and n item number one under introduction consideration passing of bylaws as it relates to Compass Housing. Um, I'll be looking for the Deputy Mayor to lead it at that particular time. Is there any other? Just last call. Okay, there is not. So at this particular time, I will declare my conflict of interest and pass it over to the Deputy Mayor. Appreciate that, uh, Deputy Mayor Akaji. And I will uh, go somewhere for a bit. Talk to you. <laughs> Thank you, Your Worship. I'll just give him a few minutes to disappear. Oops, sorry. He has left the room, the building. All right. This this evening we have a presentation. Yes, no. Sorry? Oh, sorry. It is? I don't know. If he, does he know it? Does he know he set off the alarm? <laughs> <laughs> He's running. Deputy Mayor, can we just take a two-minute recess until uh, Councillor Harland returns? Thank you very much. That gives me time to compose myself <laughs> while Councillor Harlan goes to the rescue of the mayor. All right, somebody call the fire department and let them know. And the, and the oh, oh, you oh, you can let them know. That's not the real thing. I've got a question to ask you, but I can't ask it tonight. Okay. It's a little bit of a workout. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. All right, uh, council and uh, guests. We have a presentation from Tressa Bevington from Compass Housing in Incorporated regarding the request for amendments to 302 Mowat Drive Development Agreement and Economic Development Agreement. So it's up to you, Ms. Bevington. Okay. Thank you. That was an exciting, well, exciting start to the to the meeting. Um, thank you everyone for coming here tonight. I know that you're all very busy, so I really appreciate your time coming here tonight to hear me speak about my request that we have for Compass Housing. Uh, I've got two requests that we have tonight. Um, the request that I'm asking tonight is to uh, increase our market rents that we had originally agreed with uh, in the development agreement from the town. We had agreed upon a range of 800 to 1200 when we originally made the commitment 
Um, this was 16 months ago when the prime rate was at 2.7 percent. Now we're about 16 months later in the project and at the time now the prime rate has increased substantially which I think everybody here is very well aware of. It's now at 7.2 percent. So we are asking to increase um, the market rents from 1200 to 1500 but I will say that that also includes before the 1200 was two bedrooms and we've added uh, three bedroom units into our plans to help better serve the housing crisis since we were able to have a look at the at the plans so that 1500 would be for the three bedrooms that would be in the building we are still committed to the 25 percent of the building would still be under the affordable umbrella as per CMHC guidelines so we would have six one-bedroom apartments that would be $950 a month and then there would be five two-bedroom apartments that would be $980 per month. I've handed around the increased rent so that you can compare them side by side to see the increase that we are proposing. Um, I just want to talk about the history of the agreement and what we're trying to do to still make this project viable in today's ever-changing economy. So when we started back, as I stated, it was 2.7%. We felt very comfortable with the business model that we built. Um, at the time, it was promised that rates were going to stay low for a very long time. That has not happened. We are at a 7.2% prime rate now, which is why we're in the situation we are today. We have been working closely with CMHC on this project. They think it's a fabulous project. They really think the town has really stepped up to work with us to make this all viable. Um, but the current rents that we had, the, the 1200 cap, didn't work with the new financing costs that we were facing. So we went to CMHC and asked them if they could recommend what we would be able to do the lowest amount possible while still not changing the integrity of the deal that we made with the town pertaining to the 25% affordable units, the sizes of the units, the look of the building, and the amount that we would have in the building. And these are the prices that they did give to us that we have shared with you tonight also. Um, I just want to say too that all the work that we've done on our end, I know that the town has done a lot of work. I know council has done so much work, which we appreciate a lot. Um, but everything that we've done on our project planning, we have our building plans completely drawn up and completed. We've had our environmental assessment completed, the surveys completed. Our permit for the foundation is actually in for approval. We just haven't paid our permit fee yet. We're just waiting, <laughs> but hopefully that will happen soon. And we also have 85% of our material and contracts have been confirmed for this project. So we're very confident on our end that we are able to deliver the project, um, but we do need the town to agree to these increased, the increased rent caps that we originally agreed upon. I do want to touch on some points in the building. I do want to reiterate that we have committed to the 25% of the building being affordable. There are different ways that you can work through CMHC to hit your 100 points that they have. This is the most aggressive one that they have, which is the 25% of buildings. Other developers look at um, using energy costs to hit these targets also, but we've committed to the 25% of the building, which is 11 units of the building. Um, and the other point I just do want to make is if you do average out all the rents in the building, it's still $1,253. It just, if you average them all out. So we're trying to stay as low as we can possible for affordability for the community. Um, I've handed out a Gantt chart that everyone has in front of them. I just want to show you that with our timeline, uh, it is a 12 month period that we are looking to build. Uh, we are trying to get shovels in the ground as soon as possible. One of the things also is it seems that this is an urgent request right now from us, um, but that's because it is. CMHC took longer to approve because of the housing crisis there is right now. They have so many applications in, very little underwriters, so it's taken much longer to get the approval process than it would have been in normal circumstances. So what we are trying to do is beat the winter and get our shovels in the ground so that we're able to get the concrete poured before 
the winter months and the harsh winter days. So that is why it just seems very urgent on our end, but that's, that's the way that things are right now with the housing crisis. So I just, I would be happy to answer any questions. I just want to reiterate how much we appreciate all of the town's work and all of your commitment to this affordable housing project. It's still affordable if you are aware of other rentals that are in Canada. It's very affordable for our area. We've added in the three bedrooms to hopefully service some families better, um, single parents or even parents that are looking for sustainable housing. We've looked at all of that. So we appreciate everything that you have done. But to get this over the finish line, we need uh, the town and councillors to agree to increase the rent cap that we had originally agreed to 16 months ago when the prime rate was at 2.7 and now we're at the 7.2. Oh, yes, yes, <laughs> we do. I did hand out to all of you. Um, we got our certificate of insurance, so I just printed that out for you, for everyone to see it in black and white that we do have our full approval by CMHC. Um, it was issued, which is no small feat. <laughs> it was a, a lot of work to get that issued. So I know that um, we have trust between all of us, but I just do like showing you guys that in black and white that the funds are available to me with these increased rents um they we just need to get the shovels digging to continue but i would be happy to answer any and all questions that any councillors have on this okay council um council Hina, did you have a question <laughs> yeah um we discussed this i know at one point but for the public's um the public's um view Mm -hmm. Can you um, suggest that the rents will not go up upon completion of the units? Um, it's just that uh, I, I would like the public to be publicly aware sure. of the assurance. Yeah, sure. So the rents that I put in front of you, those are the rents that CMHC has approved. So those are the rents that are going to be in place when I open. I've also made the agreement with the town in the development agreement that for 15 years, the rents will only go up by CPI or rent cap, whatever the province is dictating at the time. And it will not go up further than that. And I did make that 15 year commitment to keep the rents climbing only based on CPI. Yes. Thank you, Council Heenan. <clears throat> Anybody else, Council? Ah, Councillor Bennett. <clears throat> good evening. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor, and good evening, uh, Tressa. Uh, so you've got a 42-unit complex, 11 of uh, which units are uh, deemed to be low-cost uh, rental units. Mm -hmm. um, the initial request, uh, according to the town here, was that their, their initial approval was that the rents would be between eight and $1,200. Correct. Uh, I, I'm looking at your matrix here, your rental matrix and the original uh, rent approvals and the current request, and I'm seeing that the the rents were actually started at 950 mm -hmm. and and went to $1,200. Um, now those initial 11 low cost units, mm -hmm. uh, according to this, it doesn't look like their rents have changed. No, and they don't. That's that's uh, CMHC a rent that is dictated they tell us what to rent and that does not change so we've kept those at the same yes so it's only the it's only the all the units from 12 to 42 that that the rents have gone up on and five of those you've already indicated that have moved from two bedrooms to three bedrooms correct. and hence that equals out to the additional cost correct and that's why I just want to explain to everyone too that the 1500 sounds aggressive, but it's because we have the three bedrooms are in there. Um, we were able to get rid of uh, these hall storage units that we have when we had a chance to look at everything and, and take those out to make the three bedrooms for families. So yes, so we are still, nothing has changed for the affordable units as per CMHC guidelines. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bennett, uh, Councillor Harland. Thanks, Tressa. Thanks. So um, you had indicated that you've secured 85% of your building materials and your contractors. Correct. And currently um, the interest rate is 7.2. The prime rate is the, 7 .2. the prime rate. Yes. So what happens if the prime 
rate continues to rise and building costs continue to rise, what will happen? Will, will that mean that you potentially would come back to us for a further increase? No, I wouldn't. Um, the great thing about having the contract signed and the building material signed, which we've checked back every month to make sure that we're still we're still good, right. um, is that you know that your costs will be set. These are signed contracts that you have to sign. Right. And so, and really, I after the agreement is done and once the shovels are in the ground, I'm on my own to figure everything out. If if that was to happen, that's that's my joy to figure out. Okay. <laughs> which I yeah. So, but that's why we feel good because we do have the 85%. Right. We, for a project like this, you need to have confirmed 66% of costs, but we went the extra mile to do 85% because we just want to make sure that we're, right. we have everything. So good. this ask has nothing to do with rising building costs. We were actually able to, down to the square foot, estimate how much we thought our budget would be. We got our contracts in and we were great in there because we had the luxury of just building in St. Stephen right. um, during COVID. So we were able to compare the two, Good. and so we were, my project manager did a great job with it. Good, thanks. Thanks, uh, Councillor Harlan, Councillor um, <coughs> James. Yeah. Hurdle. 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 I'll get it in a minute, <laughs> sorry. It's nice to meet you, that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just went out of my head, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Even taught you and can't remember your um, name. Thank you. Um, and thanks for your presentation as well this evening. Thanks for coming to give us a chance to ask you some questions about it too. Again, it is it is very new uh, in the news as well. Um, but just wanted to give you an opportunity to speak about the, the GST rebate uh, that's been announced and to if or how that changes your plans. Sure. Um, I'm glad that you asked that. I Since our last meeting, I was able to um, talk to my accountant team as well as I got the bank to reach out to CMHC. They don't know it's too new. It's still just tabled. It's not passed through everything, so nobody really knows. I actually have an email from my accountant because I'm not an accountant, so I just wanted to, I can share it with you and you can read it through, but um, the Coles notes is that it's too early to know how this is going to affect. Do you want to hand those out? Thanks. Um, it's too early to know how that's going to affect, and the focus he was speaking about was also, I'd spoken to you before about the HST self-assessment that we have to do at the end and how it's based on the value of the building at the end and CRA deems how much you are to owe. So he said, and you can read it in his email, um, that we'd be looking at not a huge benefit to this once everything shakes out at the end. But I did get him to send an email, it's on the second page. Um, Hopefully you guys can read that and you could take a minute to read it through if you would like. Since I'm not an accountant, I handed it to the professionals. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Bevington and uh, Mrs. Bevington. Anybody else? This is your chance. Okay, Councilor Hurley. <laughs> I Thanks, just had a second question. I wanted to give yeah. everybody else a chance to speak oh, no, first. Please, yeah. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could talk briefly about just the timeline, uh, why we are where we are, when we are. Sure. Um, and uh, um, yeah, thank you. Okay, sure. So originally we um, did our full application to CMHC. When I say application, it takes months to get that application ready. You need all of your drawings, you need your environmental, you need some costs done, all that takes time. So that was submitted in May. If this was normal, timings where there wasn't a huge influx of applications to try to get some building and I'll just back up for a second CMHC put out a new deadline for June 19th um, where they increased the application fees that you pay up front for this financing so I kind of got caught up in that influx of applications so if it was a normal timeline when I've done other buildings it would be you would submit to CMHC they call it its pickup, like it gets picked up within four to six weeks. <clears throat> that means that, <clears throat> excuse me, that your file is opened. And then it's usually a four to six week wait after that. Now it is <laughs> substantially more. So it took them about four months to, well, three and a half months to even pick up my file. And then from there, just going back and forth because the original rents that I submitted wouldn't work under that. So just working back and forth with them. Um, and even now, if I was to resubmit today, I'd be looking at an eight month wait because it's just backlogged that much by application. So that's why we submitted in May. We were hoping when we had spoken before, oh, this summer we'll get shut. And we were ready for like 
July to be ready, and we didn't hear anything until very recently. So that's where the timelines have gone. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, and <coughs> Councillor. Anybody else? Oh, sorry, Councillor Heenan. It's me again. Hi. Anyway, um, as I said um, when we met, I said, um, like, I like to be very transparent mm -hmm. with the community because it is, after all, uh, their community. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's why we ask all these questions is to make sure that the public's uh, questions are answered as well because as you know as a council we went way out on a limb to approve this and we're very pleased to see that there are other cities that are following our uh, are, yeah. there are other cities following what we did but we were the uh, we were the Trailblazers. pioneers yeah. shall I say yeah so when you're a pioneer you have to be very transparent with the people who are behind you and they're the people of st. Andrews right uh, we are a council but we also have an ability that we have to uh, answer to the people who are in St. Andrews, mm -hmm. and and that includes Bayside and Shamcook. So mm -hmm. it's you know it's the whole thing. So that's why I think you will find that we're very specific in our questions to mm -hmm. you, and and that it, uh, they deserve, we deserve to know, and they deserve to know what is happening. So I appreciate your answers. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, and I, I don't take this lightly, all of your questions, and I think that's kind of the nice thing about this project is that we are working together. This isn't a normal process to be this entangled with rental amounts and have, you have say, but it's just the nature of this project. So I'm happy to, and it's also a very complex project also. I live and breathe this every day, but um, not everybody does. So I hope that I came across as clear as possible um, with the situation that we're at so that council can really understand where we're coming from. Thank you. Oh, Ms. Councillor Weir. Presentation, I've got three things here. Sure. <laughs> oh, you're yeah. Always forget the button. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, We've talked about 25% of the units uh, being subject to the uh, the CPI and that type of thing. Would you have a problem with putting that in the agreement? Because all we've got is, we have it verbally now, but that's it, as far as I can tell. I uh, so that was one thing. Uh, the other thing was the, the GST the Minister of Finance or the Department of Finance has issued a backgrounder on it, and they have clearly indicated that the complicated little calculation they always did at the end of approved costs, which gave you about 1.8 percent, they've assured the public of Canada that we will get the entire 5 percent of the approved costs. So it's the question is, I guess, the approved costs versus the the percentage, and uh, that's on the Department of Finance's uh, web page. It was there the day after the Prime Minister made the announcement. And you were talking about the interest rate, and I don't know whether you want to answer this or not. It's it's a year from completion. I realize financial institutions don't like to lock in interest rates till the last minute, but have they locked in the interest rate at all on the, on the mortgage or are they just floating on the, on the bridge financing until it's done? Sure, do you want me to start back with question number one? Whatever you feel. Okay, sure, with. so question number one, and um, we have a copy, but I, I believe in the agreement, it is 100% of the rents are guaranteed for 15 years to be at the CPI and rent. I already have that, that's in the agreement. Correct, yes, yes. yes. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, yes. So in the Economic Development Agreement, Section 4C, rental rates for the development will have a range between 800 and 1200 per unit and will be maintained at this level for a minimum of 15 years with the allowance of consumer price index increases. No application may be submitted uh, for condominium status or for any, any other uh, conversion to non-rental housing purposes. And this is also the economic development agreement is a schedule of the development agreement, so it is tied to both. So if we change the 
amount? Will that change it in the mm, you You changing the amount will not change the CPI increases. That stays, that's not what's being asked for change. That's what I want. That'll change the range in there. Yeah, yeah. the range Thank is you. the only thing changed. So okay. And I guess the only problem I have with that clause is this $800 keeps getting in there. We know what the maximum is. It clearly states the maximum in the motion, but yet it's $800. Now, to me, that implies the maximum is 1200 the minimum is 800 which I'm not saying it's misleading to the public, but it it implies that the range is 8 to 12, not 9.25 to 12. I can actually speak to that. So that was not meant to be misleading in any way. When we started the conversation with the town and what was put in the development in the economic agreement, at that point, we hadn't had a discussion, a full deep dive into our project with the bank. So once we went to the bank, and we had these ranges. They said the 800 just won't work for the one bedroom. Um, so that's why it got increased to that. So I can understand what you're saying. It sounds misleading. It's not meant to be. It was just the timing of the development agreement was so early. Um, and then to change that, we had already gotten the ball rolling and with that. So that's why we gave that 800 to 1200 range, because in the time, I didn't know where that would place in there. Yeah, okay. okay. And yeah, and then the last thing I'll say too is they don't lock in the rate. We have our no, approved rate. Typical. Yeah, we don't. Yeah, we well, don't have the government should never know. No, but. exactly. And they wouldn't. So it's uh yeah. So it's not locked in as of now. Okay. Councillor Blanchard. I mean, it it probably isn't critical, but just to to Councillor Weir's point, if we're changing the maximum now that we know the right. minimum, sure. Would it make sense possibly to change the minimum 950 to the 1500 just to make it a little more sure. clear yes through, through you madam chair when you come to your motion that's the time you can amend it that's and I do want to um, also say that once if we come to an agreement um, and the development agreement is okay to increase the rates we will be setting up our website and all of the rents will be on our website for people mm -hmm. to see this isn't going to be a, a secret to anybody as soon as we can we're just waiting for the shovels in the ground <laughs> yeah thank you um, did I answer all of his did I answer all of your questions well, I think so yeah. okay so okay. Okay. okay thank you very well thank you um, anybody else Councillor Bennett yes, uh, thank you again deputy mayor um, so there's three new councillors on this council that weren't part of this process of mm -hmm. you going through and getting the approval and the, the council support in in supporting with a five hundred thousand dollar grant mm -hmm. Um, that grant was issued because of the low rates from not just the the low cost rental rates but all the rental rates mm -hmm. um, if this council decides not to approve these rate rents mm -hmm. where does that leave us so that would leave the project not viable uh, because we where we worked with CMHC, the approval that I have is based on the increased rents because the the rents that I gave them originally, they would not move ahead with those because it didn't support the project as much because of the higher interest rates. So the project would essentially be dead. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bennett. Any further questions, Council? We are having a motion later on. Yeah. Oh, Councillor Arlen, <laughs> right under the wire. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I, it's not a question. I guess it's a statement. As one of the three new councillors right. from the original six, um, my understanding is that there were two key factors in terms of really the, the momentum for this uh, partnership. Mm -hmm. um, one was the, the grant. Mm -hmm. to assist in the in getting the project on the go but the other was the time frame mm -hmm. was um, ensuring that we had a, a building and apartments mm -hmm. that could be rented within um, a year 12, 12 months to 15 months mm -hmm. so that we could have people in mm -hmm. 
place to both um, support our town in, in terms of um, jobs and, and people who are wanting to come and live here mm -hmm. to increase our, our population. So I think that that's an important um, statement that I think we need to continue to reiterate was we were providing a grant, but we were also looking at a timeline mm -hmm. in terms of when this project would be completed. Mm -hmm. And you're still able to adhere to that timeline. Absolutely. Nothing yeah. else. Uh, I can. I don't need any change on any of the timelines that was given in the development agreement. I don't need any extensions right. based on this. And that's why I gave everyone a Gantt chart to see, so you can kind of see where we'd be at each month on a high right. level, but no, there's uh, we don't need any adjustments with that if we can get the shovels in the ground. Yep. Uh, thank you, um, and Councillor Harlan. Councillor Aheenan. Yes, just one more point to keep in transparency thank you. is the fact that uh, we speak of the $500,000, mm -hmm. but the public need to know that half of that approximately is not going to be paid Correct me if I'm Correct, wrong. Yeah. Until the project is completed. Yep. So, so we we built. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. No. Yeah. I just want yeah. in in fairness to transparency. I just want because people would think we're writing a check no. for five hundred thousand. No. And I just need people to know, it's a breakdown. Correct. Thanks. Yeah. So we had the way that we structured the agreement, which I think was really fair, is we got the original two hundred seventy-five thousand dollars that went directly for the purchasing of the land. Um, and then we wrote it in because it was really important to me to know that for the town to know that we're also working hard to make sure everything happens. And so the way that we worded it in the agreement, which is normal wording in the development world, is that we received the $225,000 once we're substantially complete. That's the language that we put in there, which is what all the banks use. Um, and then it's important to note, too, that that $225,000 goes directly into the project as well. That's not going to my company. It goes directly into the cost of the project. And I just want to reiterate also that this 500000 if I didn't receive this 500000 from the town, this project would not be happening. Uh, CMHC loves this project. They worked really well like with us. My bank actually had a call with one of the managers there, which is a very big deal, because they wanted to see this project happen. So it's very important for everyone in the town to know that there's real impact on this grant that we're receiving from the town to make this 42 unit happen. And we as the town are, are grateful that this is going ahead. Yes. Well, hopefully going yeah. ahead when we pa maybe pass it later on. Yeah. Any more questions, yeah. Councilor? Oh, uh, Councilor Weir? Yes, uh, just to follow up on Councilor Heenan's comment, sure. transparency. Uh, I tried to find it in the agreement. I, I think it's in there that the 225000 will be pledged as security for the interim operating loan, whatever you want to call it, interim financing or whatever. Is, is that the correct understanding of, of what the agreement says? No, it's essentially being used as a developer's bond. So if something happens that mm -hmm. the proponent doesn't finish the project or correct. walks away for whatever reason, <laughs> that's the town's share to go after and complete the project or decommission it, whatever whatever the case may be. So in here, I think it says as security. I think that w the way that we just put the word, and sorry to interrupt, Chris, but I think that we just put that as wording to know that that will be used in our budget line. We had to put that in for the bank for full transparency, that they know that we're receiving this from the town that will go directly into the project. Because the last thing that CMHC ever wants any developer to do at the end of the project is have money in their pockets, <clears throat> which it sounds funny, but that's not the mechanism that CMHC is built for. It's it's made to make housing affordable for Canadians, and they don't want developers at the end benefiting financially off of this. They want it to go back into the project. So it's a budget line on my budget. This 225000 when substantially complete, will be put into the final costs. And so it's not used as security. No, no, it's and, just, and we're actually the security yeah. holders, uh, Councillor Weir, so typically, um, for projects like this, we'd either require you know a bond from mm -hmm. from an insurance company or something for the completion or cash in hand. Uh, but there's an agreement between the town and the proponent at the time that instead of releasing the whole grant at once, that the 225 would be withheld until the until substantial completion, which Correct. is 90 percent 
of the completion of the project. And we did have a bond with the town for our Anchors Landing project. We did have a bond with the town. Um, and I knew this, and I knew this might be something that the town would bring up. That's why I suggested, hey, I don't need it up front. Let's put it on the, the back end. And so there's some security there. But I'm not walking away <laughs> from this project. But there's some security there and that the town has some confidence that they still have those money in there in the bank. But it is a budget line on my end. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. Um, just more a comment because I think that uh, was mentioned a couple of times here this evening that transparency and accountability are very important, and uh, and we are accountable to the community as well. And I know how this this will this is probably landing with the community is likely the same way that it landed with me the first time I heard about it. Is there was a bit of a, a not a bit, but it was a disappointment. Um, and uh, similar to what uh, Councillor Harlan said, there was those two main components of it, which was uh, uh, affordability and timeline, and it felt like those two things po were possibly uh, in jeopardy. And so um, I think I was kind of taken back, and I'm mm -hmm. sure that there's going to be some, some digestion of this with the community as well. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, when I looked at, at the information that you were provided to us as well, and knowing that the affordable units... There's no change in the, in the cost of the affordable units. There's some what I consider to be uh, moderate and very reasonable uh, adjustments to some of the other units, but that's explained also with how you're sort of um, uh, modifying the units as well. And the timeline actually hasn't been impacted as, uh, either, really, and it's still holding to the commitment that we've made. So, yeah, of course, I mean, on the outside, this can be a little bit off-putting, but I think mm -hmm. from my point of view, um, it still seems very reasonable and very rational. So, so thank you very much for, for explaining and clarifying this uh, to us. I think it's important um, and that we stay as, as uh, accountable to the community as uh, they're holding us accountable to. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And I just want to make a comment based on what you said, um, that we're not enjoying this process. This isn't like a fun thing to come back to everyone with and be like, because, you know, when we were waiting for CMHC and then we had the shift and then they told us these new rents and we were like, Ugh, like, but then we got our full approval. So it's kind of been a roller coaster. <laughs> but um, uh, because if they hadn't approved these other rents, we would have had to go back, reapply with the new rents and it would be an eight month wait. You don't just get to change it. But because their love of this project, um, they were able to work on it quickly. So I just want to reiterate to council, we're not enjoying this process either. This isn't fun for us. We want to just get going on everything. And um, But also we're very hopeful because there is an answer and we're not walking away from a bit of frustration from CMHC, not you guys. Uh, Councillor Weir. Uh, again, you follow up. <laughs> yeah, sure. You could probably guess I'm the third new counselor. Yeah, <laughs> that's okay. Yeah. Uh, in the uh, economic development agreement, again, I'm all about transparency to the mm -hmm. public. We are elected mm -hmm. and we, we have to hold ourselves to even a, a higher standard than we hold ourselves mm -hmm. if we're making an investment, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Correct. That's just my opinion, not, mm -hmm. not anything else. But in the, in the economic... Uh, which one have I got? Uh, in the development agreement, mm -hmm. it states, and the sentence reads, the economic development agreement shall work as bank security for the project. And so if it's, if it's bank security, to me, the entire 500000 is now committed either to purchase the land or to provide security for the project, for the bank, or whatever there's uh, we're not getting we're not going to get to leave the 225,000 in our account regardless of what happens whether it goes ahead or doesn't go ahead or or whatever once the project is is underway that money's committed mm -hmm. and uh, just a matter of writing the check whether we write it next month or next year mm -hmm. it, it, well it's, it's one, spent yeah. Yeah, so. I think that the wording in it, I can understand your interpretation of the using as bank security, but I, the way that we read it when it was put in the development agreement by the town was because we wanted them to know that we needed all of this money for this project. And so that's the bank security because when we're doing our budget with the bank, that's a, an item. And I didn't want it worded that it would just be written out to Compass Housing. I wanted it to be specifically on what we're using it for 
in the project. So I appreciate what you're saying, but also when it was put that way, I was comfortable with it as a way to, that everyone's assured that it's going to be used for the project and not written out to my company to be a separate deal. I wanted everyone to know that it's going into the project. No, I, I wasn't implying it would okay. go to you at all. Yeah. I, I, I just wanted to emphasize that we have committed the money yes. and we don't have a way of not writing the check in a year's time. Right. Just, uh, again, transparency and uh, complete openness about right. the process. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Weir, and thank you. Uh, Ms. Bevington. Yes, Councillor Heaney. <laughs> I would like for you to just speak to the public, please, about the specs of the project. Uh, you've mentioned that you've got five three bedrooms, but um, I would like to assure the public that nothing has been uh, jeopardized, like the heat pumps are nope. still in place. Everything that we spoke about is still in place. Am I correct? You are correct. And there's uh, balconies. Yep, balconies and, in and each And heat apartment. pumps in each unit. Each apartment. Correct. Each unit. So I want. I need the the public or the town to know right. that everything remains the same in the development yes. of the project yep the look the feel the size of the apartments has, has the only thing that's changed is the three bedrooms now that's changed we've gotten rid of some storage uh, units all of the, the heat pumps each unit has a balcony we've actually added on uh, cathedral ceilings to the second floor since we're increasing some rents to give people more value it's a really nice feature um, as well as looking at some other upgrades in the building that's all the same appliances dishwasher fridge uh, stove. My, uh, no stove yeah dishwasher and that's all the same um, so nothing ha we haven't we haven't cut anything from the yeah to that's save. What I want. that's good yeah no and that's important you thank you councillor Haina Oh, yeah, like what? Sorry, like like how many? Like oh, how many three bedrooms? Two so bedrooms. we've got so we've got six one bedrooms, we've got thirty one two bedrooms and five three bedrooms, and also a, um, a lot of the two bedrooms. All of the two bedrooms have office space. Yeah, all of the two bedrooms have office space. The three bedrooms will have the third bedroom instead of the office space, but can be used as office space. So, um, how big are the offices? Sorry, how big is the office? Are the offices? about 80 square feet in an office in each um, apartment so that if people are working from home they do have a workspace. COVID really shifted a lot of our ideals about what an apartment should look like and we've been able to incorporate that into into our plans. So nothing has changed. Good question though. Thank you. Thanks. And thank you Councillor Heenan. Oh, any other uh, question Council? There, I see none so Thank you, and if you'd like to stay and as we go through the rest um, with the motion, sure. we, and sure. I'd be glad that you stayed. Sure. Uh, but thank you for your presentation and for being here in person. Yes. Now, do we go on to the, the next part, which is the uh, introduction and consideration, because the, the motion is the first one, rather than bring the mayor back. Hello. <laughs> we'll just do it together. Yes, sir? Okay. All right, so we're going to go into introduction, consideration, and passing bylaws and motions. And number one is uh, Councillor Heenan with uh, Compass Housing request for amendment to 302 Mowat Drive Development and Agreement and Economic Development Agreement. Councillor Heenan. Thank you, Your Worship and Council. And thank you, folks. Uh, a point of uh, question: Do I read it as it is, and then and then we'll do an amendment? All right. Thank you, Your Worship. It's reference number PED two three zero nine zero seven. Compass Housing Incorporated request for amendment to 302 Mowat Drive Development Agreement and Economic Development Agreement. The Town of St. Andrews has received a uh, request from Tressa Bevington, Compass Housing Incorporated, regarding an amendment to the 302 a Mowat Drive Development Agreement and Economic Development Agreement. As heard tonight through the presentation, the request is to modify the uh, agreements to reflect the change in the rental rates from $800 to 12 
from $800 to $1,200 to $800 to $1,500. Prior to Council making a decision on the requested amendment as per Community Planning Act Section 53 bracket 3, uh, sorry, 59 bracket 3 and Section 111, the Town must call for a public hearing of objections noting the variation of the resolution agreement. And the motion is that the Council of the Town of St. Andrews sets the date of Thursday, October the 19th at 6.30 p.m. in the W.C. O'Neill Arena Complex Council Chambers located at 24 Reed Avenue, St. Andrews to host a public hearing of objections on the Community Planning Act Section 59.3 and Section 111 for the purposes of amending the Compass Housing Incorporated Development Agreement and Economic Development Agreement for 302 Mowat Drive to change the stated rental rates from 800 to 1200 to 800 to 1500 and I so move your worship. Thank you Councillor Heenan. I need a seconder please. Councillor Neal. Thank you very much. Now we have to make the amendment. Oops, sorry, Councilor Batcher. Let's go with the amendment. Oh, okay. Go right ahead. <laughs> Just, uh, I wanted to make a motion to amend uh, from uh, and the rental rates uh, instead of eight hundred to tw or to fifteen hundred. Uh, the amendment would be uh, nine fifty to fifteen hundred to better reflect the actual rental rates. Second that. Okay. So first, <coughs> answered. Uh, a second by Councillor Weir. All right. Okay. Any more discussion? Oh, Councillor Hurdle? Thank you, Worship. This is just a detail and point of information. Um, I'm just going through the affidavit of execution, and it doesn't, I know there's a solicitor that's weighed in on it, but it doesn't seem to be notarized by a stamp. Is that, uh, this is just a copy, but I'm wondering if the original actually ha has, has a notary stamp on it. It went through about 600 lawyers and a service in New Brunswick, so we will so revisit good? that to okay. ensure. But it, 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 uh, yeah, it, it went through two separate lawyers as it went through and picked up by uh, service New Brunswick. So if it had service New Brunswick had issues without the notary seal, they would have uh, rejected it and okay. sent it back. So we're confident. Yes. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor uh, Har um, Arland. Um, thank you, Deputy Mayor. I, I just have a question regarding um, the date for the hearing of objections. That's the earliest we can schedule it in, is it? Uh, through your worship, uh, it's correct. You actually have to have 21 days. So, oh. like, I will be posting it tonight. So, it, then that's the earliest. And actually, it's set at 22 days. So, it's really the earliest we can host it. It's unfortunate. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Knopper. All right, Council, let's um, go to the first motion and then we will pass the, is the amendment first? Or? Uh, you need to vote on the amendment. Amendment, okay. We'll vote on the amendment first uh, to change the rates from uh, 800 to 1200 to 950 and 1500. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary minded? Carried unanimously. So now we'll go to the first motion, um, which um, talks about the hearing of objections and at the arena. Uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Contrary minded? Carried unanimously. Thank you very much. Can I get Brad? You can bring just the a Your Worship, I guess I just had one quick question for, from staff on that was, Staff was considering that after the hearing of objections going right into the, like the same night of having a meeting to approve the amended agreements. If you're okay with that, if you want time. That's council, that's fine do you want to go but, right into it or not? We could have the hearing of objections like at I see a lot of and then, and then mo special meeting right after if you're okay with it. And I see a it lot only of- It requires no. one reading. Wait, what? Sorry, Councilor Riddle? The, the question was, does it require two readings? The answer is yes. no, it only requires one reading of council because it's a development agreement, it's not a bylaw. Right. Okay. Good. Thank you. Uh, does that answer all the questions? So we will do that after the hearing of objections, have a special meeting for that. Thank you very much. Now you can get the mayor back. Mike, oops, sorry. 
Thank you for coming. Thank you guys. Thanks very much for your presentation and for coming, Tressa and your and your dad too. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right, thank you very much, Council. A quick question before we jump in. There's two real items on the agenda. Does anyone need uh, a little break before we jump into the budget, or do you want to keep going? I had one. Yeah. Very discreet break. I don't know if you knew I left the room. <laughs> All right, let's just jump into. So uh, the next item on the agenda is the 2024 Budget Draft 1, which is FA230925. Um, so everyone has it within their package. At this time, I'll pass it over to Mr. Spear to lead this particular uh, part of the uh, of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Worship and Council. I've presented to you uh, copies of the slide that's behind you. I just put something together for the public to be able to see as well. So um, we'll get going. Just as, as as a starting point, over the first couple of meetings are really to give you the information where staff is thinking of. If you want to debate stuff tonight. It's okay, that's your will, but it might be better to get the whole picture over a couple of meetings and then uh, figure out exactly how you want to, you know, cut and slash or add and improve and manage tax rates and stuff like that. So for tonight, we're just looking at the operations. Slide two, please. So for this year, it's kind of a new process for some of the, of, of the councillors. Last year, just to remind everybody that during local government's reform, the council didn't have an official role in the pr preparation of any of the budgets, that there was a facilitator that was overseeing every new municipality and old municipality throughout the province, that uh, I tried to keep council as informed as I could because really it was, uh, it was the same crew, you know, was, was going to move forward with the three new additional councillors we knew were going to be coming along. And so it's given us, uh, it's really the first budget of this, of this particular council. Next, please. So what they've done is created two tax zones starting last year. I did found out we can create additional tax zones, but you can only do that by like April or May of the previous year. So we have to go through with the two tax zones for this year. Uh, we'll have if there's ever discussions about creating additional it'll have to wait until next spring to have that discussion um, I've never done it and I think the province would challenge us a little bit but it's just so you know that right now uh, specifically uh, the Bayside and Sham Cook communities are both consolidated into one tax zone con currently and if we have discussions that you'd like to look at revisiting that we can have that after Christmas and uh, see if, if we'd like to do so our tax rates right now for uh, Bayside and Shamcook is at the end of last year, so this year's ca tax rate municipally is, is 55.62 cents, but then you pay a provincial levy, which is for the roads to the Department of Transportation, so your total tax rate is uh, 96.67 cents. For the town of St. Andrews, it's $1.1428. In 2022, so the year before amalgamation, we uh, Bayside and Shamcook paid between 92 and 90 cents, and then the town was at a dollar 20. Um, I'm sure most councillors know, and, and most viewers, but because of class rates and, and different things, that these apply primarily to residential homes that are owner occupied. If you get into commercial rents or, or apartment rents or, or secondary homes, the, uh, there's additional charges and stuff on top of this. But for the town, we don't control any of that stuff. All we can control is the basic mill rates. So some things to take, take into consideration is the consumer price index. That in 2020, it was only at 0.2. Then in 2021, as the effects of the uh, pandemic kicked in, it hit 3.8, and then in 2022, we really saw high inflation at 7.3%. And these are all to New Brunswick. Um, year to date in 2023 to the end of July, I had the report I was looking at, currently the average is 4.02%.
Now, a big part of our operations, especially public works, relies on fuel. And just as a comparison, in September of last year, it was $1.62 for regular gas, and now we're up to a pretty near $1.90. And this is from the <coughs> New Brunswick Utilities Board in diesel, which is a significant part of our operations. Uh, last year was about $2 a, a litre, and it, now it's up to two fifteen dollars a litre. And insurance costs. In 2020, our insurance bill was only $100,000. As of 2023, it's 176,000 with a potential increase of 10% in 2024. Now, I will say a couple of things. Is number one, last year's included the acquisition or you know the consolidation of the other communities, so the liability went up a bit. Because of inflation, uh, all our assets are in replacement costs, and so as the construction costs skyrocketed, so did our cost of our inventory that we had to insure and. And so it's not all profit from the insurance company that that the total um, the, the total insured has been going up some. But having said that, the risk for municipalities is still considered high. And in discussions across the province, even before the amalgamation, everyone was seeing 20 to 25 percent increases in 21 and 22. So it, it's it's the, the industry has been it, it has been hit hard, um, and also important is there's not very many underwriters that cover municipal governments uh, unlike home insurance where you can go in and have a dozen or 20 different underwriters there's only two or three in the market that actually cover municipalities are willing to accept the risk <coughs> and uh, they may or may not talk to each other so uh, shopping the rate around every year isn't practical having said that our brokers do Keep an eye on that thing, and over the last few years, we have switched between brokers, or not brokers, sorry, between you know underwriting firms, once or twice over the last decade. Uh, but if you do that too much, they also play catch up with you and consider you a high risk for future profitability. So now we get into the numbers of the of the operating budget. Uh, we just started off by saying tax revenue will grow by five percent. I didn't look at tax rates. All I assumed is tax revenue growth. Personally, based on what I'm hearing on um, uh, assessments of, of individual homes and things and how much they've gone up, I think we'll probably see 8 to 10% growth just in the assessment base. And then, so hypothetically, you could reduce the uh, mill rates in order to get the 5% rate, hoping it's more um, in the slide well, I saw today, sorry, it's, it was preparing the report for the uh, council budget that we had about $13 million worth of construction in 2023, which is about a 2% increase in our assessment base, if that all goes right into the, um, goes right into the uh, total assessment base f for next year's calculations. And I've only used an inflation factor of 3%. So in general operations, um, and I'm looking at the summary page that, that might, if council's following on, on the larger numbers, is that despite 5% growth in tax revenue, other revenues are projected to be flat unless you request us to increase rates, which again, you, you can certainly do. Now in 2003, we did have an anomaly that we had $100,000 surplus from uh, two prior years. And so to remind people that in order to make us have a balanced budget, what they do is if we have a surplus one year, it becomes revenue two years down the road. If we have a deficit, it becomes expense. So over the course of two years, you're always running a balanced operation. So then that's how they do it. So uh, municipalities aren't spending themselves to oblivion or hoarding a whole bunch of cash. Um, and so in 2021, I had a, uh, there was a construction um, project that uh, I had overestimated when I did the year to end things and when we corrected it at the audit we had a hundred thousand surplus which is unusual but now it's income this current year we're in and we're losing that in next year's budget so there's a drop in, in that revenue in expenses uh, even though we put three percent inflation we did go line by line a lot of them and drop some as we saw based on either historical uh, figures or uh, specifically if we saw that uh, there's projects that we could reduce, we did. And so the overall growth in expenses is only 3.4%. Uh, 
Uh, an important thing to know is tax revenue to capital is usually six hundred to seven hundred thousand dollars. Why that's important is that at the end of the day, we always have enough tax revenue to meet our needs operationally. A anything that's left over is going towards capital projects. So we don't have to borrow or, or find new grants or increase user fees through the roof. And so. Uh, the capital projects are going to be a different discussion because they there will be a night on their own, but usually in the past few years we've looked at about a six or seven hundred thousand dollars surplus from operations that can be used to help finance that. So I'm going to start going through department by department, just touching on the highlights. There's some new initiatives that I just wanted to bring to your attention um, that we can either discuss tonight or, or down the road that uh, that could create savings if you need. So administrative services, which is basically town hall and council, does have an overall increase of, of 10%. Included it as an executive assistant to the HR pool, which is approximately $55,000 in total wages and benefits. Um, advertising is up 20% in anticipation of the municipal plan cost that we'll be putting things out if we're from mail outs to advertisements to Facebook and things, and there were anticipated costs with that. Local planning inspection services are up 11%. I have gone back to the RSC to double check that because our increase was at a higher rate than other municipalities. So I'm challenging that. I'm not suspecting they're going to say our mistake will drop it by $10,000. Yeah, so I inquired on that yeah, and it's, okay. it's the adjustment that we have is due to the fact that our community tax base grew, the assessments grew higher than everyone else. So as such, we pay more as a result of that. So. The prize for being the fastest growing community, I guess, uh, is uh, additional costs associated with that. And I believe, and to follow up with the mayor, I believe the, um, under the Regional Service Deliveries Act, I think that that type of calculation is legislated as opposed to something that was devised by the board. It's a hundred percent. These these questions and, and comments are exactly the ones I had. It a yeah. hundred uh, percent. As I went line by line and said, I literally <laughs> not to pick on Saint Stephen, but Mayor McEachern was five. I'm like, how come his went up this percent, ours went up this one? And it's there's no flexibility. It's the overall number. Yeah. You up that costs us more. Lower that costs us a little less. Thank you, Worship. Um, equipment rental, which is a relatively small line item, around. $12,000, but it is a, dish, a huge increase this year. Um, We're going to be over budget this year from all the meetings and stuff, just photocopying. We'd underestimated, anticipated how much the additional counselors would cost when we were doing it. And no offense to anybody, it was just, <laughs> it's just the actual cost of doing things on. And, uh, and so we're going to be over budget this year and going forward to next year. So janitorial, it, there is a 20% increase. We've been using them a lot more, f uh, specifically for washroom cleanings. We've been getting, a, in prior years, we we're getting complaints. It's just such heavy use that we either have to hire staff or, or have them come in. We feel their contract is worthy and they're extremely flexible and, and good. But, the, and, but it's not all in their pockets. It's, it's not a reflection of additional charges from them. It's a reflection of additional services we're getting from them, honestly. And telephone is up 45% only because we had it in $2,500 in the budget last year. We couldn't operate two months with a telephone at Town Hall and all the cell phones for $2,500. So there's just an error in a previous year budget. Uh, fiscal services. So fiscal services is basically loan payments and interest. Um, right now in this version, it's a little bit I don't like the word loosey-goosey, but until we get the capital, that'll change that quite a bit uh, with interest and stuff. I will say that in last year's budget, we thought we were going to have a big debenture borrowing because of the wharf by now, and we haven't. We haven't started the project yet. So I think the 2023 interest will probably be lower than budgeted significantly, and we will revisit that when we do the September statements just to do a, a calculation. Uh, council just uh, borrowed last month for debenture, but it won't come out till uh, December, and so that's only you know a month's interest for that for, for additional borrowing. Economic development. So we're still carrying forward the cost of an economic development officer, um, probably either after the budget's approved or, or, or into January. We'll have to figure out exactly what that looks like, and I know there's many options, which the mayor's talked about in the past. But right now, it's around, I think, about $80,000 in total. Um, maybe, you know, there might be a discussion with some of the other things we've looked at if that's enough, but it's, 
it's where it sits right now and maybe it's something we should talk about a little bit before I approve the budget. Something added under economic development is that we've had three large community organizations request totaling $38,000. Um, in addition to, I think it was 18 I put in for just the overall assistance grants uh, budget. So that's uh, $56,000 to aid the community. That's a significant portion. I'm not going to say they don't deserve it, but I'm just saying that's a significant increase from anything we've done before. We've capped out at 18000 in the past, and frankly, over the last few years, uh, just before this council, came on, the prior council increased it from about ten or 12000 to 25000 I think it was, um, for assistance grants. And uh, we've been going along with that for the last few years. But uh, we will be having a meeting with these three organizations sometime in October for them to present their case and talk about what their initiatives are that need to be supported. Policing. So policing at this point is my best guess estimate. They're working on it. Um, they're trying to consolidate things because of local government reform. So I use acronyms here, but the MPSA is the, uh, the Municipal Partners Service Agreement, which basically is the Old Town's federal contract. And I'm saying 5%. That's as best as I know right now. That they've told us before the end of, well, they did tell us before the end of September, but we'll hopefully early October we'll get the numbers about what that'll look like. Uh, for the for the contract that came in from Bayside and Shamcook, the original budget that was presented uh, to council was understated on the policing, and the government fixed it when it went into the department without increasing the tax rate. But so the twelve percent increase is really probably like four or five percent from last year, then eight percent from this year. Again, these are estimates at my point, but we will have a more solid figure in the next couple of weeks to see where it comes in at. Uh, for the fire department, there is an overall increase of 6%, which is primarily the result. Council approved an additional half an employee there. As you know, we hired a bylaw enforcement officer and a second employee fire truck or a driver a pumper operator. And so that's all the reason that's up. Public works. So Overall increase of 7%. Uh, insurance, because of their fleet significance, so it's up 46%, which is in large in dollar amounts. Fuel is up 18% is their estimate, or $10,000. Um, they haven't still gotten into uh, large trucks that can do electric yet, so we'll see, and it might be time or ability for that in the future. Asphalt, we've increased by 17%. A couple of reasons, number one, is asphalt of main components diesel so if diesel's up the cost of asphalt goes up uh, the other problem I issue we've run into is there used to be a plant in st stephen a temporary plant that was operated by you know, northern yeah okay thank you councillor Ware, that um, <laughs> ran it for years there and so we used to be able to run down our own trucks to get it but now we have to run to st john that they've stopped operating that for at least three years and so we've We've been running the same budget, but taking a lot less asphalt because we've had to pay extra fees to a trucking company to bring it down. So we're starting to fall behind a little bit, and so we're asking for an increase in order to at least keep up. And this is just to basically potholes and repairs. This isn't like the capital projects that that will come in later. Um, now, salaries and wages are, are up. Or, an increase of 7%. There was an adjustment to wages towards the end of last year that didn't make the budget. And so that seven, so really there's only a 3% increase in the budgets, but then there's plus a retroactive increase that didn't, so year between year budgets, it's 7%, but year between year actual is only going to be 3%, if that makes sense. There's no increase in staffing or anything like that requested. It's just, it's just between where the budget was last year and where it needed to be this year. Now, something that's not included, and we could even go on this a little bit further, is there are a few intersections along Route 127 that do not have lights, which surprises me, and I, you know, that usually, they're, you know, street lights. And uh, typically, like down St. George Way, just about every major intersection has a street light on it, so I'm not sure. I have asked NB Power about it, I've asked ETI about it, and no one's putting in street lights, so I'm just, if the town thinks it's worthwhile putting in, the rental fee of those things isn't very much. So it might be worth, you know, adding 
it, you know, under the tax regime, it would be put out to Bayside and Shamcook. I think we'd talk no more than a couple of thousand dollars in total to add maybe half a dozen to ten at everything. Like I think even like Glebe Road doesn't even have lights on them, which, you know, the last I looked, I was, I'll look again tonight, but I, I was surprised at that. We've had people that complained about it, and we've tried to have them installed, but we just can't get anyone to act on it. So just if the town wants to, to help their citizens out there, it's going to have to be us that pays for them, hoping that there's power everywhere. Well, I agree, and it's so it's you know we add an, another two thousand dollars to the theoretically if that's what we want to do it. So we, you know we have a local cost. We get into that question of what's local cost versus shared cost. Well, transportation is a local cost, so on top of the forty-one cents, we'd add a couple of thousand dollars t towards their tax rate potentially. You know that we in, within the mill rate that would be used to help pay for those. So we can do that. It, Well, so the quick question or answer is, if every street light you see in a, in a previously rural area was paid for by the province of New Brunswick, but other municipalities are facing the same challenges and face the same challenge as far as, um, as trying to get action by somebody. So some of them have just elected to pay for it themselves to meet the residents' needs. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I can answer that a little bit. Uh, in my previous uh, LSD of uh, the town of Lincoln, we uh, we had two mill rates, and the reason why we had two mill rates was uh, when part of the community wanted to have street lights installed, um, it was approved, and part of the community didn't. So the they, there was a different mill rate. So. Every household that lived in the community that wanted street lights, our, our mill rate was $100 a year more. Uh, flat rate, $100 a year more per household that lived on a street that had lights. The houses that, the streets that didn't have lights, it was $100 a, a year less. Uh, the problem we have is, is we don't have streets <laughs> Route 127 either way yeah there's a few little ones but not much but like at my house you know I pay for my yard light uh, separate meter for it and it's I think $24 a month uh, for a yard light but uh, as far as street lights down on the highway you know, it's, it's out in the woods <laughs> so, and, uh, you know uh, and uh, I realized perhaps out Shamcook way there's it's a little more densely populated but once you buy the ghost road well, <coughs> there at Walwig there's not a lot of place for uh, street lights it's just it's the way it is yeah no, I agree it's just I, I look at some of the developments that are off the Glebe Road and what the tax base is that come from those it's a hard thing to, to see the percentage that is getting taken away and here we are sitting at 20 cents and we're finding a way some to cover that it's just it's hard to it's it's hard hard to apprehend if there is a, a, a street or a road uh, that that is worried about safety and the fact that they're told that on top of what they take they're gonna have to pay extra if they want a light when it's it's just I don't know if there's something there with the UMNB to, to negotiate to say that if you're in Shamcook Bayside at, at some point you are St. Andrews and we can't say it both ways, right? Like it, it seems a little bit both ways at times. So anyway, I'll let it, I'll let it go, but that, that's a really interesting one that, uh, that went off that. Absolutely, Councillor Ian. I just feel that 
a lot of the mailboxes are in the dark, like at some of the road intersections, and especially in Shamcook. I mean, you will, you can't stop and get your get your mail because it's too dark at night. And I think that a couple of the streets really do need street lights for that convenience for people, especially when it gets dark at four o'clock. Thank you, Worship. Anyway, I'll put some more thought into it, but I've never thought of it from that perspective. Thank you for bringing it. Didn't think that would be the most contentious item. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's lots to debate. There's, there's lots to debate. Hire people. But... <laughs> I want to buy more fuel. <laughs> Street lights. You never know. Sorry, Your Worship. So under cultural services, um, so these are the museums and, and, the, and the courthouse. Mostly status quo with some minor inflationary increases. Um, I will say for the Ross Museum, in honor of the 200th anniversary next year of Chestnut Hall, so it's of the structure, not of the actual museum, uh, there is a 17% overall increase. Um, we're extending the season by 12 weeks. We had a discussion several weeks ago about that. We didn't have a budget to do the Christmas open house. So essentially, this is to extend it. And so we can do that again next year. Um, and both the clerk and I also think there should be a better opportunity to touch base with some of the cruise ships in St. John to see if they could come and visit our uh, facilities. So we're going to work on that over the winter to see if they can do tours, because right now they tend to come by bus, get dropped off on Water Street and picked up in four or five hours. So we, we're going to try to drive a little more traffic to the, to the Ross and the courthouse and the archives if we, if we can convince them to. And then um, within programs, it's just, to, I think, everything from lights uh, to create some more banners and stuff. There's an $8,000 increase, so they always operate between $1,500 and $2,000 a year. So we bumped it up as a one-time thing to $10,000 next year. Probably a potential, the, the clerk knows about getting grants, so there's probably a chance that we'd offset a lot of that with grants in the end anyway. But it, it, it's there just so they can start planning. And they actually presented to us their plans for next year and their programs for the 200th anniversary. So they have that all there. And if I can remember, maybe a future budget, we will uh, include that with you. You can see what their plans are. Uh, under recreation, uh, at the Harry Mallory Sports Field, we have repairs and maintenance are up 25%. Now, that's to reflect higher costs. S substantially, it's a big field, so there's a lot of uh, 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 fertilizer and lime that has to go and do it usually twice a year and then we're also the soccer nets uh, especially I think the physical poles have to be, be fixed the high school ones the adult ones so that reflects most of that we also have equipment maintenance increase uh, our mowers are just hitting the th three to four year age with all the work they do they run five days a week from from the first of May to the end of September and so it's just reflecting that we need some. It's not a big ticket item overall, but it's just a, a, it's, I think a 30% increase if I remember the top of my head. Um, I am requesting that seasonal staff an additional four weeks of employment. That is kind of a new item that they usually run from just before uh, May, late weekend, the long weekend, up until the end of October. But with the recreation manager bringing in more stuff, and um, shoulder season events going on more. We're finding that uh, public works is getting drawn away more. So it'd be good to have that additional staff another two weeks in each end of the season just to help with all those things and to continue some of the things. Uh, even something as, I wouldn't say minimal, but what Hurricane Lee, the staff lost almost a week getting prepared for it and removing things and, and putting them away. And so the asphalt program is two weeks behind because they had to pull that stuff out and they're just getting back to it. So I think it would be a good addition to have if, if council so's do. For the uh, W.C. O'Neill Arena, um, we had a lot of miscellaneous ice rentals in the past, uh, usually in the twenty to $30,000 range pre-pandemic for various reasons. Um, we seem to get a lot of teams out of St. John uh, minor hockey that couldn't get ice time up there and came down here. So whatever happened after the pandemic, we haven't attracted them. I don't, I don't know if there's less teams, more ice available in St. John, I'm not sure. Or they might possibly go into uh, you know, Black's Harbor, it's a little closer, or possibly St. Stephen, I'm not sure. But that we've budgeted that revenue item down 76%. Uh, the dormitory rental is increased to reflect what we're doing with um, the Algonquin. They used to be a seasonal 
uh, lease uh, on the arena dorms now. They've this will be their third winter starting this year that they're going to occupy it all year. So it's to reflect those extra wages and or extra uh, lease payments, which we're always great for. So the overall expenses are up 7%. Um, the recreation fees paid to the RSC is up, but we, uh, we basically, we pay it out and they send the check back in a meeting with, uh, it's the way it works, I can see some of you, but in a meeting with uh, the CEO of the, of the Regional Service Commission, he said the same thing as the rest of us, that's kind of a silly system, so they're going to try to <laughs> just pay the difference, you know, so we're getting $15,000 more at the end of the day from um, areas that are still deemed to be part of our recreational zone, but that aren't part of the town, so parts of Boca Beck and um, Oak, Oak Bay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like Public Works, the wages and benefits are up more than, um, and the budget are up more than inflation, but it's only because of an error made in last year's budget that after we had submitted it to the province early, Council had made a decision to increase some of the wages uh, over what we had submitted for 2000, for this current year. And so we're playing kind of a, on budget numbers only, we're playing a bit of a catch up so that the budget were actual. So again, there's a 3% increase for staff in the um, budget for now. And that's based on actual. So I think there's 7% in the budget, but that's not the plan to give that those particular employees that much of an increase. Now, recreation uh, and programming is a new department for us, and that's, you know, uh, the work of, of Mr. Henselpacker. And I told him, dream big when you present your budget to us. And in fact, I presented to you, like he'd given a, a written up statement just so you know what he said. So f besides Canada today, he's looking for another $20,000, which he has perfectly laid out for various events throughout the year. Um, the, we also are looking at a plan for a fee-based uh, summer day camp. And so we've been talking back and forth and he has experience over in, in his previous employment in Eastern Charlotte about running camps with the Y and he says that people are willing to pay for it. You can enhance the experience and provide more things. But that's been built in both from a revenue perspective, if there's $18,000 in revenue, and there's um, I think $8,000 in extra expenses that were included. Um, council can debate whether or not they think they want to charge. We have worked out a system where he, that for those that may not be able to afford it, that we're looking for sponsors and, and other ways to do that, that if you do the math, what I've put in for revenue doesn't equal all the 30 campers times eight weeks. It doesn't quite work out to the revenue. We cut her back just to try to see if we can encourage so but council can talk about that exactly on the day camps It'd be good to figure it out during the budget time only because there's revenue in there so if you decide in April to cut the revenue of eighteen thousand dollars and staff are going scrambling to find out where we're gonna cut it otherwise to do it uh, and the big item under there is the recreational master plan and so the RC as you know did one three years ago I think and it cost them close to six figures. It's important to do this. It establishes where money should be sent, what programming should be prepared, what it's gonna look like over a five to 10 year period. There's also the ability that if you have these recreation master plans in, that to go get grant funding for different things, including to get the recreation master plan, to be honest, that there's uh, the, the governments or agencies will look positively on that. And so it's a big ticket item. I think it's a necessity. And uh, talking as, as an accountant, I guess, instead of thinking it's a $40,000 one year, it's $40,000 spread over 10 years that will be used to be able to guide your processes over the next decade. Um, for the wharf, no substantial increases for now. I will say I did notice as, a, just <coughs> as I was preparing the slide, there was an error on the paper one I gave you, neither the insurance column or the wages column uh, carried over. So if you go to next report and see that there's an extra uh, 60 or $70,000 in expenses, it's a, it's, it's a formulation error, not an not a adjustment to the budget. So we'll correct that in the next version. Um, youth Center. 
So there's a request. So right now we, we've always had a position for an employee to help the supervisor. That was always a 30, three quarters position, 32 to 34 hours a week. Uh, that, that employee, who I hope you've met, Sandy Alfred, I think it was, great guy, and uh, but he's also helping Mervyn in the recreation, so it helps expand things so that there's additional employees to help for any of these new potential projects. So they're asking to put that to a full-time position, and although the wages increase isn't significant, it will mean the person can get full-time benefits, so health and dental, RSP, and all the things, and so that's reflective in here if council is okay with, with moving that position to long term. The Bayside Community Hall, there's just inflationary increases for now, but we'll be meeting with the committee over the next three or four weeks just to see if there's anything special that needs to go in there. We haven't had a talk to them for about a month, so in Mervyn's away, so we just thought we'd uh, wait till we go there. But it's an uh, important asset, but a, but a small budget item, so even if we uh, add increases to it, it, it won't be a significant increase to the, to the item. Uh, for those at the meeting, or sorry, I discovered tonight too when I was putting together the slideshow that I hadn't included the utility budget, so I handed that out at the last minute before we came in. It's there before you. Again, there's only inflationary increases only in it, um, and we will revisit that uh, once the capital projects are in. Well, we'll touch base that we are trying to get consumer base or sorry consumption based uh, billing in for next s spring and we've had an emotional roller coaster over the last s few months with technology trying to get because some of our meters and the readers are more than a decade old and some of the new technology doesn't like to play with the old technology but we think we've solved it all so we're going to be sending out the team to read the meters for the initial read this fall and so that by March we can then calculate what the consumption based and so we'll be moving. Uh, right now we haven't put any increase in the billings. The, once we add what we recommended capital in order to meet the bank payments, you may want to increase the rates in order to, to follow through the capital project. Although internally, or myself, where bank rates are kind of high right now, I don't know if this is the time to go out and borrow a lot of money. I, I personally think we've probably peaked. But we've got a banker and an ex, an accountant also here, and they might say I'm crazy. So, but either way, we'll have to have a discussion on how much we're going to borrow. With, with the uh, utility especially, we we don't have significant funds left over from revenues to put towards capital projects, so probably 60% or better of our funding has to come through borrowing for any new capital initiatives. So we'll have to think that one through fairly well and how do council like to proceed. So for tonight, council, that's all I really have, just to focus on the operations, that again, the capital is a couple hour presentation on its own. I didn't want to overwhelm us uh, too late tonight. I would take either questions or if there's anything in here that you think has been missing or or anything like that, and I'd certainly be happy to go, and we'll be having a lot more discussions over the next few weeks on it, and so tonight's not the last night we can talk about this stuff. And if I think uh, the t 8th, 10th is our next meeting to discuss the budget, which we'll go over capital, and we may have the presentations that night as well. Perfect, so uh, uh, what you highlighted was obviously the, the major changes versus year ago. Um, I guess my question to you is once we go through the capital uh, projects uh, or we'll have a chance to go back to this list to say is this something that as a council we have consensus that we want to do or we don't want to do is that the expectation of the process here? I think so your worship I mean certainly if council thinks some of these requests are over the top now we'll adjust them accordingly but if you'd like to see how it all fits in together before you take those cuts that I think would be a good thing but it's right. up to council to give me instructions and how you'd like to process this. Okay, I think the value would be to see the whole big picture because if you have a lot of capital projects, that basically could impact what your views are on operation and vice versa. Um, so I think it's important that we see the big picture, but I don't want to just, we heard it, it's in. I, I do want to go line by line. I'll give you an example of the recreation master plan. Uh, that's just one that we should have a bigger conversation about because every time we do a master plan, 
what comes of that is a lot of expenses associated with it. So is it something that we want to do? Not everything, and I'm not saying that we don't, but not everything can be a priority for us. We do not have the funds to do that. So if you're doing a recreation master plan, be prepared to make a bigger investment into recreation. Um, and the other thing I'll say on, on just that one, and that's the example that I'm using, is we also have basically a transportation plan that we haven't really done a whole lot with yet. So now we're getting another plan. Like, let, let's talk about things like that and go line for line. And I know there's a bunch. I guess my question specifically that, that jumps out of this is, I, I know there's an increase in janitorial services. And when I get into the budget, it, it's kind of by, um, you know, town hall, youth center, it's all broken out. What is the total amount that we pay in janitorial services? And is there a certain point where that is such a large number that it would actually be a really good paying job within the municipality to do, right? So, so the quick answer, Your Worship, is we look at that on an annual basis. We pay around forty-five to fifty thousand dollars a year. The problem is you'd have to hire a person and a half for the flexibility that the contractor gives us right now. They come in early mornings, late at nights. It's a part-time job through the winter, to be honest. It's a person and a half to two people through the summer because we're running seven days a week to clean washrooms and things. And so, it's it's tough to make it a full time, you know, just within the town. Could we break it up some, potentially? But as far as having someone committed to all the janitorial, it, it's just so inconsistent, and for the hours it has to be covered, it, it, it's quite tough. Okay, perfect. And then the other, uh, I guess, exercise that'd be a lot of value as we talk about utility, and I know we're going to get into the capital projects, but um, I don't know if it was this council or the previous, but we really kind of, I think it was this council minus the three new councillors. Um, we kind of said that we, we realized St. Ayers for a while was bragging that we had the lowest water rates in New Brunswick. We were one of the lowest, but the truth of the matter is, is we weren't keeping up with our aging uh, infrastructure and having the lowest rate for a service that everyone else is paying more for, <laughs> something's got to give there unless there's a way you can get water cheaper than everyone else. And we know how far Shamcook Lake is away. Um, I think what we did is we kind of acknowledged that we wanted to be middle of the pack if at all possible. We didn't want to be on the high side. So I'd be really interested to know, are we still exactly kind of in that, what we think that would be? Because um, the cost of water is going through the roof, and I know that the costs associated with that are very significant. Um, but that one's that one, if I look at it and I look at the debt of the town, the uh, utility fund is actually the one that keeps me up at night because if you do everything that the asset management plan indicates should be done, uh, we will hit our threshold of what we can actually borrow. So um, I think flat rate billing, and then again, I'll go to everybody else to have comments, but I think the flat rate billing, I, I think it's, I'm not saying it's it's not right, but to, to talk about reducing carbon as a municipality and making significant investments when we're still telling people they can put as much water as they want on the lawn, it kind of, it, it doesn't really go hand in hand to me. So I think getting into actually what you use is what you pay is it just in today's world makes sense and i think we really i know there's a lot of challenges around that but i think it's something we have to figure out i i think that uh we're probably in the bottom 50 percent of municipalities that aren't doing that now i would say that majority of municipalities are in fact metered and what you use is what you pay to some degree but i'm not 100 percent sure on that but those are my comments right off the get-go any other member of council councillor harland Thank you, Mayor Henderson. So I just want to go back to janitorial for a minute. So um, the current contract that we have is for it. Does it include all of the town buildings? So well, um, so it includes town hall and the washrooms, the um, RCMP building. But does it include the library? and the museum we'd have to go facility by facility but library yes town hall yes uh, museum no wharf yes uh, centennial park yes um, public works no uh, uh, the arena front front arena they uh, that's part of our increase this year is now that we're using those as the washrooms for the vic for visitors they're making a trip or two a day keep those cleaned up um, I think that's I think that's it so, oh you sorry. center you center too okay so you said the library yes yes okay because I I, I do wonder you know it, um, is that something that we want to 
I, I hear what you say in terms of the fact that uh, it would have to be a position and a half. <laughs> I wonder if that could be incorporated with um, uh, an, another position within public works or uh, because it's a lot of money for a contracted position. It doesn't include things like the wellness center. The wellness center pays separately for the... Well, the, the, the total budget would include the wellness center. Right. But there's one primary contractor and a right. smaller contractor, yes. Right. Yeah. So yeah. I, I, I think that there is benefit in at least looking at are there other opportunities to look at what some of the other needs are within the municipality and is there some way to um, uh, incorporate a position similar to what we did with the fire department, right? And the uh, bylaw officer and the fire truck driver. So. Yeah, I, w I was looking at that option, but if it's if it's 45 to 55, that's an, that's that's essentially a position. And if you go lower than that, you're always going to be recruiting. It's a, it, it just. I can tell you every business out there right now is struggling with maintaining janitorial services and if this is a fit that works I would for if it was if you came back and said it was 80 90 then I would be like okay we can really hire someone but <laughs> yeah 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 I almost <laughs> like to make motion to step down as mayor uh, but uh, yeah no I hear your point that's what I was thinking on that one but I think we would be hard pressed to do it for 45 to 55 thousand dollars and be able to maintain it in a consistent way because um, I do know it is expensive though Thank you, Your Worship. If I could add in uh, something that I know I've brought up to you and some of the town staff already. Uh, last winter, just shortly after I became a councillor here on staff, uh, you know, it was winter months and it was pretty quiet in town, uh, you know, as quiet as it gets anyways. And there was a gentleman showed up and he was furious that there was no washrooms available. It was the wintertime months and the town, uh, the town office uh, washroom was closed. You know, and he, uh, the gentleman came into the town and, and into the herring, and uh, he asked to use the washroom there. And, and you mentioned shortly afterwards about being at a, a sub or a sub place and getting a sandwich, and the, the people gave you a hard time. Uh, you know, uh, about the number of uh, tourists and stuff that use the washrooms and stuff. Um, now that our shoulder season is not really just a shoulder season, but it's a continuation of of tourism year round. I think it's really necessary that those downtown washrooms need to be accessible year round. Uh, I think it's kind of irresponsible that we ask the masses of people to come visit our towns and in the winter months there's no washrooms available. Uh, and staff did a, a notify me then, that was something I wasn't aware of, that the O'Neill Center's washrooms are open every day, but that doesn't help people when they're downtown, uh, down around the wharf area on, on Front Street. Uh, when they want to use the washroom, you got to use the washroom, and they shouldn't have to run back up to Tim Hortons or, or go in and beg a, a local provider to use their washrooms. There should be public washrooms available. Thank you. Um, I think that that's a very fair fair comment. And the other thing I'd say is, we could look at it. There is a tourism accommodation levy where we keep some of the funds and. That washrooms primarily are used not for people that are in the community. People in the community are going to specific businesses. They're, they are they'll go home to use it typically. Um, that is something that the taxpayer of St. Andrews does pay for visitors. Um, so, where the taxpayer doesn't have to pay it, you got to think there's a way to maybe utilize some of those funds for such a purpose because it is product development. Believe it or not, washrooms are part of a tourism community, um, and uh, I have heard those to your point. And uh, yes, that did happen. Somebody said that they should have a tax break because of the amount of toilet paper they use for people that aren't actually customers of theirs. And when people are downtown, if we're not open, they're using a private business that is paying the, the water bill, they're paying for any of the services and the cleaning, right? So uh, it's, those are fair comments that I, I think we should put to the parking lot with the other items uh, and add that in. So thank you for mentioning that, Councillor Bennett. Anyone else? Councillor Heenan. Your Worship, on Councillor Bennett's um note which i totally agree with perhaps during the winter we could go to one washroom a general washroom instead of instead of maintaining two we could maintain one and that would uh, that would alleviate the problem plus the fact is it would also cut down on janitorial i mean it's just be for the winter months like say january february and march but it still would be less cleaning 
And to follow up on Councillor Harlan's uh, remark, if we if we had this position, we'd also have to provide a vehicle. We'd also have to provide uh, a lot of um, a lot of tools for this job. And I just don't see we could do it for forty-five thousand dollars and have the uh, availability and the variety of the amount that we have now. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Han. Councillor Hurdle, or Councillor James. <laughs> Thank you, Your Worship. Um, just regarding insurance, obviously that's a, uh, no, don't worry about it, uh, a, a tremendous expense for the community. You mentioned that it's difficult to find providers, but I'm wondering if you could speak to um, the process for shopping around. Like, do, obviously, is there a term? Does the term come to an end? And at which point do we put an RFP out, or how, does, how would that work? So for an RFP, all you're really doing is shopping for brokers. Like, we, as a town, we can't get direct bids from... From, um, from the underwriters themselves. What's complicated matters too is, uh, I'm sure as you know, intact insurance is basically swallowing up any and everything insurance company right now. So the competition is, is getting less. Um, so we do have one, one broker we've dealt with about six, seven years ago. We did go to an RFP, but the RFP can only be good for that one year, if you know what I mean. And as things change the prices go up and down so the only thing and brokers are all going to be going to the same underwriters i mean they're like a middleman essentially and so they might be able to pl play with their commission a little bit but we rely on the brokers that they're looking at the competitive marketplace and looking at the two or three suppliers and, and making decision they come down they had a visit with us and actually in september to start this year's process even though it doesn't renew until the new year uh, to, to have a look at everything and, and see what we can do but um, like I said I, I've gone straight across we certainly can go to RFP again probably should wait a year and the only reason I say that is it's it's quite a long process not even on our stand part but once we get it out it's for them to prepare and get back to us but at the end of the day it's really brokers all fighting to be your representative for the same for the same uh, underwriters so it, it, you know the process is flawed that way there just isn't enough competition uh, that, that makes that worthwhile that you can have to rely on your local broker that the you know, your successful broker to be doing it for you I do talk to other municipalities just to see where we are every year after year and we're better than some and and no worse than others um, I will say there was a, uh, a group, it was called FAINB, the French Association of Municipalities, that tried to go self-insuring. And for a few years, they did fantastic. But when things went wrong, they went really wrong. And so they had to abandon their plan. Mm -hmm. So there's a discussion on the south here. Every once in a while, we talk about having like a, a group type of thing. But then you're, it, that gets risky because let's just say we have the best risk package in all of Charlotte County. We hire... Um, I don't know, we hire somebody to come in and make rest assess of every sidewalk and every street every day. We might be good, then one of our neighbors in whatever direction might be terrible that they have big potholes and let two inch breaks in their sidewalks and only partially do their arena correctly and buildings are falling apart and then you're gonna end up paying for them. And so for this particular style, especially liability, it's probably not the best model. We're continuously looking at it. Um, and in all of those are big numbers, I agree 100%. For us, as part of the overall industry, they're minuscule. I mean, it's billions and billions of dollars of industry. And so many of the underwriting competitors have just abandoned it, they don't care. Uh, Lloyds of London, a very famous um, underwriting syndicate out of overseas, are only one of one or two of the major players that are willing to underwrite a lot of the stuff now. So we have local underwriters in the pro or in Canada, sorry, but then they're going across seas to have you know the bulk of it underwritten there. Yeah, thank you. So so long as we're inviting competition, I think yeah. that's the important thing. And yeah. just a second question, if I may, Your Worship. Um, <laughs> uh, regarding coverage itself, is it is it sim is it I shouldn't say simply, but is it basically um, asset pr property protection liability insurance, or is it, is it is there a component that's also, you know, financial loan default insurance too? Like, is, is it is it just about assets? Uh, mostly assets and liabilities, environmental, some business interruption. I'm, I'm, 
be happy for those interested. You might be the first council that was a, a council that was actually interested in insurance, but anyone that wants to come in and have a look at the, at the presentation they, they give on it, it's there. Um, and I could even provide a quick summary of everything. Uh, but primarily assets, and there's some within our liability. There's a whole bunch of subcategories of things that are covered in, in portion. But liability is very expensive. We have a $25 million limit, which is a little higher, but then we looked at reducing it, but the savings in reducing it wasn't much, to be perfectly honest. So uh, with our wharf, we thought if something ever happened, mm -hmm. pick, pick an accident and you lost several people, that it could get very expensive. Um, and then assets. Uh, one thing, and to go back, is that the arena hadn't been properly valued for a few years, and they came in and did on their own an independent study. And we know the Gar Salon Center cost $13 million to build. And I think our arena at the time was only valued at two or three million. So it's not the same as the Gar Salon Center, but you can barely build a nice house today for two or three million dollars. You know what I mean? I'm exaggerating, but but it's, you know, well, even this apartment building that we know, we know it's gonna be multiples of two million dollars. And so there's been increases because of that stuff playing catch up that have caused some of that increases too from the 100,000. So again, it's not just the insurance broker, the insurance company, it's also that the valuation we have internally has gone up significantly. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Bennett. Thank you again, Your Worship. Uh, just to get back to uh, your discussion on water rates and how other communities do it, uh, just because of my time uh, being a retired soldier and moving around the country a lot, I've lived in a lot of different communities, uh, and most communities do it the same way. Um, they charge uh, one rate for cubic meters of water, and whatever your cubic meter of water is, you get charged, say, 50 cents for a cubic meter of water, and then your, your sewage is charged at double that uh, the double rate of the water. So if it's 50 cents for a cubic meter of water, then it's a dollar for your, your waste uh, to, uh, to clean the waste up. Now, some communities choose to bill monthly for your water. Some communities, uh, to save money and administration, they only, uh, they only bill quarterly. That way there's not as many bills going out and it doesn't burden the, the community in paying all the bills and stuff. Uh, so that's, that's basically the two ways that I've seen it in uh, the many communities we lived in across Canada. Uh, the other question, or the other point that I'd like to bring up, was that uh, several times, times now over the past few months, uh, I've also discussed uh, for an ad to the budget here, and one of the ads was uh, for some uh, funding of uh, about fifteen thousand dollars for Dock Road to uh, fix up and repair Dock Road and uh, and the beach. Now we did have approximately for Sham Cook about twenty-two thousand dollars for this year from the gas tax uh, kickback from the province. So that was really probably doesn't need to be in this coming budget if the money's already there this year for it. And the, the $22,000 is there and I think there's approximately $8,000 for Bayside. So whether it's in this coming budget or we just use the money from this budget, uh, this year already the money is allotted. Uh, I'd like to see that on the tables. So we've added that under the capital projects. So when we discuss all the capital, that will be... Th it, it, it was it it was there yeah so that that'll be debated as part of the capital project so it, it is included um, just uh, well uh, our CAO is speaking I did do a little research on uh, he mentioned that the out-of-town rentals are down for the arena as one of the things and I checked in uh, it, it appears st. John uh, to rent ice for youth sport is still $21 higher than what we are um, but we all know the price of gasoline right now I'm, I'm, I'm probably making an assumption here but i think that they probably the distance it is from the city have made the decision that the 21 dollars is well worth it to absorb versus five or six cars going down there um again that could be a factor in all of this um anyone else Councilor Weir. yeah i just wanted to comment on the insurance uh, i think what mr spear said is is right uh <clears throat> the brokers are going from you know intact for three years and then somebody else for three years for liability insurance uh, the only time I've seen a significant difference is some company last one I saw was in Newfoundland went directly to Lloyd's of London negotiated a special rate for a group for an industry and was able to give some very attractive rates for four or five years but then suddenly they come right back up again. Uh, I went back with the broker. 
because uh, I was getting better service and uh, yeah, I didn't get to, well, to London didn't take me to dinner once a year, but <laughs> at least, uh, you know, it was a lot less work. And uh, this insurance business is, it's a brutal industry. There's no question about it. It's, it's truly brutal. And if you've got a good broker that is shopping properly for you, They'll call you and say, we suggest to you, or can we want to move you on the liability, here's why. And if you've got a good, honest relationship with them, it uh, takes a lot to switch. You know, you need, you, you need a good reason. Yeah, agree. <coughs> and even your, uh, even your dinner you paid for the next year with the rate, so. That's our sphere. And I'll say, Your Worship, too, we do have direct access to the key account manager. It used to be called um, Cowens, who does a lot of miscible work. Now they're intact. But uh, nonetheless, so we do have at least the brokers are still involved, but at least we're getting, you know, direct service uh, to be able to talk to the key account managers there, to, you know, to get their interpretation. We're always working on risk. I will say they do add a lot of value-added services, and so... For everything, like even legal agreements, we'll fire it off to them within a day or two. They'll have their own in-house legal look at it and provide any feedback. Only on a liability perspective, to be clear, they're not worried about, you know, economic sense or anything. They're just looking if we're covered from a liability and insurance perspective. But they've even, we're going to be proposing um, uh, a proposal for Vulnerable sector uh, 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 kids, you know, w for adults working with children, and and and, ad and so we sent that to them. They sent back a whole bunch of recommendations and things and best practices, and they're always sending best practices for different things from hall rentals to this and that. So, so it's we give them a lot of money. I admit, but they are providing besides in case types of insurance. They do provide a lot of value added stuff to try to help you reduce your overall risk and costs and. Again, as you know, that we've been lucky. We haven't had a lot of um, a lot of claims over the last three or four years, which is good. And if we have run strong programs like that, that, that looks favorably and it flattens out our rates. But if we have, and there's some places that have continuous claims, their rates are going up by 40 and 50 percent a year, because you know, uh, like we said, I said on the slide is about 170 thousand dollars. But one or two bad claims will eat that up. One or two bad claims would eat up a decade's worth of premiums, to be honest. And so um, what Councillor Weir said is correct. It's a brutal industry, and uh, but they are partnering with us to try to make sure that we're following best practices as much as we can to minimize any risk or exposure we have along that way. Thank you. Councillor Harlan. Um, I'm happy to see uh, an increase or, or some line budget items for recreation. Um, I think it's critical that we support this new position that we've put in place and I think recreation program recreational programming is critical for our community to grow you know I think about New Brunswick Day I know one of the recommendations that um, Mr. Hanselpacker is looking at is some increased uh, activities in New Brunswick Day this town was hopping on New Brunswick Day this past year almost I would say almost as much as uh, Canada Day and we draw a lot of people into this town so it's wonderful to see that he's he's doing some visioning in terms of looking at opportunities and I think that that's really critical I I hear what you say um, Mayor Henderson in terms of you know be careful what you ask for in terms of a recreation master plan except that um, I think it's important that we develop ourselves as not just a tourist destination and not as a retirement town and in order for us to maintain um, families young families that are growing we need to have a very uh, active uh, offering in terms of recreation moving forward so I, I'm happy to see that I hope we, we go forward with it I, I completely concur with your comments they're lined I guess uh, to rephrase is um, I've never seen a master plan that asked for a budget reduction. So if you're going to do a master plan, be prepared to invest more in that particular one. Don't do it just because it's a feels good statement. Do it because you believe like you do in spending more because that's exactly what comes out of those. Otherwise, it's another document that sits on a shelf that we paid $40,000 for, right? So. 
Anyone else? Okay, well, thank you. We're not done uh, because we did add closed session item, and I'll ask Mr. Knopper, put him on the spot, and ask him to uh, to read uh, that compass go or that compass that uh, council goes into closed session, and I'll let you say as per. Uh, which of the so, acts? As per Section 681C, information that can cause financial loss or gain to a person or the local government or could jeopardize negotiations leading to an agreement or a contract. And Section J, labor and employment matters, including the negotiation of collective agreements. So before we move on that, I did skip some process there to try to move the meeting. Question period, has there been anything submitted? There is no one in the audience. Is there anyone online? Sorry about that, Council. I got ahead of myself. I caught myself, though. Mr. Bates, do you have any questions? Please raise your hand. Mr. Bates, you can unmute and ask your question. Hi there, this is Andrew Bates. Uh, I just wanted to ask, what were the three community groups which made the $38,000 in funding requests? It broke up a little bit. Is that the three community groups that are requesting? Um, I'll let you, but it, from my understanding is it was Sunbury Shores, it was the Archives, and dial a ride Katie's, Katie's no, no, Cove Inc. Katie's Cove Inc. ride does, but it's not part of that, that major three. Correct. Yeah, those are the three. Any other questions? Thank you. Nope, thank you very much. All right, uh, councillors' uh, comments? Any member of council? Deputy Mayor Akaji? Just to remind you that September the 30th is Truth and Reconciliation Day. We are having it at Indian Point at 5.30, um, hoping to get a lot of drummers out and do the solemn walk, so please come. Um, any uh, donations that we will receive, we will be using towards Truth and Reconciliation um, activities in the future comings. Uh, what I do hope is we can get a number of drums for our community that can be housed at the school and maybe have a youth that is a, a drum keeper. And, uh, and then we can borrow them for events that we have. And maybe uh, even a grand grandmother drum. I'd love to see the huge drum here, but uh, that's in the future, but we're hoping to do that. There is one that's going to be offered in St. Stephen as well at one o'clock. I know that this is the um, fall fair because of due to the storm they had to postpone it, which causes conflict. But there will be one at one o'clock uh, by the lighthouse or the pizza place in St. Stephen. So there will be a truth and reconciliation um, group there that will be um, also doing um, a solemn uh, recognition of. Truth and Reconciliation Day, or it was the beginning of Orange T-Shirt Day, but now it's Truth and Reconciliation Day. So please come out if you're in St. Stephen or you're nearby and you want to come out, you can come there at 1 o'clock. Please come to ours at 5.30. Um, we will be there um, to keep us informed about what has happened, what's continuing to happen, and hopefully never let them in, out of our hearts. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor, and I look forward to Saturday being there at 5:30 with you. And Thank you. of course, the new uh, the new crosswalks are a wonderful yes. addition on the sure. on the walk. And I think it's important to note, just because I noticed last year that it's you're supposed to walk in silence. Yes. I noticed a lot of people use it as an opportunity to talk, but there's lots of time to walk around the point and have your talk. But I think it's important to reflect because that's the one thing I think we could have approved on from from the past. Oh, there you go. <laughs> uh, and I don't think it'd be appropriate for Councillor Neal and I to discuss how we are St. Andrew's Dragon Boat champions. Is that no? Okay, we'll we'll save that for another meeting. It's been long enough tonight. Um, so we have uh, the reasons for going into closed session. Can I have a mover? I've got Councillor Hurdle seconded by Councillor Harlan. All in favor of going into closed session? We're in closed session. We'll give a moment for technology to shut down. Thank you, everybody, for watching this evening.